Hello and welcome to Bible study as we start our new Bible study. Uh, the Bible study is, is on the witness of Isaiah. And so we're looking at Isaiah through the lens of what Isaiah tells us about Jesus, about what he witnesses for us, uh, all the prophecies that he says specifically about Jesus. And so I didn't record last week. I'm going to try and combine last week's and this week's, which covers a lot of stuff. Uh, and so last week, we first talked about the witness of the Bible. We talked about how reliable the scriptures were. I showed a, a graphic of how many manuscripts there are of the New Testament versus a lot of ancient history. And I have all of that data if you'd like to see it. But the general conclusion was, I had my master's in history before I went into theology, uh, the, the conclusion of history uh, is that it's not a question of, is the Bible historically accurate? It's really that with how attested the Bible is, is history as accurate as the Bible? Is ancient Roman history, is Plutarch as accurate as the Gospel of Matthew? Uh, all of these scriptural texts that we have in the Bible are immensely attested to. They are incredibly historically reliable. And we talked about how only some belief in a vast conspiracy of people uh, that had worked together to spread copies of the Bible and to spread the Christian message uh, for some kind of gain, uh, only that could explain how many, many copies there are. But the problem with conspiracies, we talked about with conspiracies, there's a clear question of who benefits, right? Qui bono, uh, who gets uh, something out of it? And we talked about the early church. The early church didn't get anything out of it in an earthly sense. They got killed. They got crucified. They got tortured to death. They got burned alive. They got thrown to lions. And so the question is, why would these people spread this Bible that they believed in the scripture? Why would they die for it? If it was all just a conspiratorial lie, who benefited? No one, earthly speaking, benefited from the growth of the church. Now, you could say, you know, maybe in the Middle Ages or later periods of history where the church did immense uh, 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 amount, uh, a vast amount of wealth and they would, did gather uh, power and those sorts of things, then sure, uh, you could make some kind of claim then. But for the early church, no, they were suffering poor people who gave their life for the gospel. Uh, and we know very clearly that they believed it, every word of it. They believed that it was true. They died for it. Uh, and Isaiah was that type of a preacher. He had to deliver God's word to a people who didn't want to hear what he had to say. And he put his life on the line to deliver God's word when all the false prophets were saying things that were nice or that people wanted to hear. Isaiah was giving them the truth. Uh, Isaiah tells us a lot about Jesus. Sometimes Isaiah is called the fifth gospel because it has so much to say about Jesus. Uh, and so I'll read today from Isaiah chapter 1 to start off, and then we're going to fast forward uh, to Isaiah 6 and 7. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which we, he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts 
had not left us a few survivors, we should have become like we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of your bur of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new months, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. All right, so that's uh, uh, the lion's share of chapter one that I've read. And what is Isaiah saying? He's saying that God's people have forgotten him, that even animals remember their owners, but humans have forgotten that God, Israel, has forgotten their God who made them. Uh, and that's the extra damning bit, is that Israel was supposed to be this missionary nation, this holy people, who were spreading God's word, and they've forgotten about God. They, they're just going through the motions. Uh, basically, God is asking them, uh, why are you behaving like practical atheists. You you might say you believe the right things, but you don't actually have any faith. You're not actually uh, believing as you do these things. They're just words to you and empty words to you. Uh, that's how you're treating them. God says that he's tired of them trampling around the temple and doing all of these ceremonies. He's like, no, your heart is not in it. You have no faith. These are just meaningless things to me now. In fact, I don't listen to them anymore. That is is a damning condemnation from God. That is harsh words uh, that God gives. You know, he just says, these things are a burden to me. I'm tired of your church services. Uh, if you don't believe in me and you don't actually uh, hear what I have to say, then don't bother, right? Uh, and so that's the tough message that it's sort of, you know, Jesus says in Revelation, uh, you know, I'd rather you be cold or hot, but the lukewarm I'll spit out. Uh, and so these people are lukewarm, right? They, they might know some of the right words, but they don't actually believe uh, what he's saying. And so he calls them to justice. Uh, they probably think, well, we're better than all these other heathens around us. But God says, no, you guys are the ones who should know better uh, and you're not acting in faith. But even after all that condemnation, we get the gospel promise. You know, he says, though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow and we as Christians know that Isaiah's words here are fulfilled when Jesus bleeds uh, his crimson blood right he bleeds uh, on the cross to die for sinners so that we could be washed as white as snow uh, and this is something God offers to us not because we deserve it not because we've earned it but just because he is gracious and loving to us uh, and this is the uh, a brief summary of, of what's happening in Isaiah now we're going to skip ahead to chapter 6 to what we talked about this week. Uh, and I'll read chapter 6 and try and get through the vision here of what Isaiah sees. In the verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say this to my people, say to this, my people, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like the terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. All right, what is happening here? Isaiah is caught up into the vision of heaven. He has been preaching. He has been pro prophesying, proclaiming God's word to God's people. And he gets brought up into God's presence and he sees God and the angels. And he is so overpowered by the drama, by the awesome majesty of God that he is undone, he says. He is lost. He is dissolved, Luther translates it. Uh, he is just so sinful. Uh, and he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And you might want to say, but Isaiah, you've been preaching, you've been prophesying. You know, even if you have other messed up stuff in your life, aren't your lips good? But Isaiah is saying basically the best part of me, uh, even that is too sinful, is too unclean to live before God. And this shows us this biblical image that we are so corrupt. Uh, we are not just something that needs a polish or a shine uh, or a little tweak here or there. The Bible says we are dead spiritually. We are dead in our transgressions and we need God to raise us to new life. That's the message. That's the idea. And so Isaiah confesses his sin and the angel who is seraphim, a burning one. So a fiery angel goes to the fire, grabs a coal with tongs that are he's too off for him to grab and he burns Isaiah's lips. This is a death experience. This is like all the sin is just being burned up. Uh, Isaiah is just dropping dead from the heat. Uh, it's just too much. And then God lifts him up. His sins are covered. He is forgiven. He is raised up. This is what God does to us. He baptizes us. He brings us to newness of life. There is death. There is resurrection. Uh, and, and that is the image we're given, not kind of a, a little gradual improvement. Uh, and here with the coal, oh, we could say so much. Uh, we could talk about Holy Communion. We could talk about absolution. Uh, we could talk about the resurrection of the dead. Uh, all of these are things that should be brought up in our minds by this dramatic vision of the holiness of God and the grace of God. You have both of them, the law and the gospel right there, you know, uh, sin condemned and sin forgiven. Uh, and then we have Isaiah's call. He says, here I am, send me to preach. Uh, and then we hear this almost kind of cynical uh, description, but it's an accurate description of what's going to happen in Isaiah's ministry. He's going to preach and are people going to listen to him? No, they're, they're going to hear his words, but it's not going to penetrate their hearts. They're not going to trust in God and repent. Uh, they're just going to hear the words. Uh, it's not really a glamorous image of preaching, but it's a part of preaching. It's a part of our sharing Christ with others is that a lot of times people aren't going to listen. They're not going to care. They're not going to be interested in it, but we keep doing it. God goes to such extremes just to save so few, right? Jesus says, wide is the way to destruction and narrow is the gate uh, to salvation. There are few who find it. And yet Jesus uh, became man. He came down from heaven. He suffered on the cross so terribly uh, for our sins to save us. That's how badly God wants to save us, even a handful, even a few, right? The, at the narrow gate. So 
That's Isaiah 6 in very, very, very brief. Uh, Isaiah 7, verses 1 to 10. Oh, I'm running out of time. Um, I'm going to give you the Coles Notes version of Isaiah 7, 1 to 10. Ahaz is the sort of weak half-wit son of his dad, Jotham, who is a tougher king of, of Judah. He tried to keep Judah more independent, uh, but this Assyrian empire, this huge empire is threatening them. It'd almost be like if you were like uh, a mayor of a little town in Norfolk or Haldeman, right? Uh, and then the United States is this big country just looming over uh, you, right? So he is this little ruler. He's scared. He's not as tough as his dad was, uh, and he's afraid. Uh, and all of these other uh, little groups, you know, if we're using that analogy, so you got uh, this guy in Haldeman who's scared, and then you got Niagara, and you got uh, Windsor, and you got all these places coming and saying, yeah, let's rebel, let's fight against this big enemy. Uh, let's let's go against Assyria, or in my analogy, let's go against the U.S., right? Let's go and, and take on this big uh, this big power. We can do it. And Ahaz is scared of fighting anyone. He's a coward. He is pusillanimous is the big word uh, to describe a small spirited man. Uh, and God comes to Ahaz and he's telling him, you know, you can do it. You can fight. Have faith. And it all builds up to this verse nine. And, and God says, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Uh, and it's a Hebrew play on words. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a line that's saying, you know, either you believe or you crumble. Uh, trust in Yahweh or fall to pieces. And to make a very long story short, Ahaz falls to pieces. He doesn't have faith in Yahweh. He builds altars to the foreign Syrian gods. He trusts in them. And God is just, he's trying to, to woo Ahaz. He's trying to, to bring him into the fold. And Ahaz, he's just too, too small. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 7. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sha'ol, as the grave, or, as, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. So he's trying to say it piously. He's trying to say, no, no, I won't bother God. Well, God's asking you to bother him. He's asking you to interact with him. He's asking you to pray, uh, to ask for this miracle. And Ahaz is saying, no, no, I won't. Uh, he's just not even interested. So God is, is upset. Ahaz is going to destruction. The, the nation of Israel is going to be uh, decimated. But every time there's bad news in the Bible, God brings good news. He brings gospel hope. Uh, in the Old Testament, he's always pointing us to Christ. So verse 13, and he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So all throughout the Old Testament, we've been waiting for God to enter the picture and to defeat the devil. And so here he's asking, you know, the house of David, house of David, believe, rally, fight. And they're saying, no, no, we're too scared. So God is saying, you know, well, you're going the way of destruction, but even despite that destruction, I will still send a sign. I will still do a miracle. A virgin, uh, a woman who has had no relations with man will conceive. She will bear a child and the child will be called God with us. Uh, so much I could say uh, about this text, but again, it all points to Jesus. Isaiah is all about pointing us to Jesus, who is the Savior, who will rescue us, who promises us that God is with us and loves us, forgives us, uh, and calls us to be his own. And that's the good news of the gospel. Until next week, God's blessings.